Ooh. They say we live now. It says we live. We are oh, live. Shit. Yeah. They done messed up. They done messed up again. Because they gave us Here the mic. Go. They gave us the camera. They gave us the time. <laughs> oh, shoot. Hey, y'all. Uh, I have an amazing guy on with us today uh, for our afternoon, our first afternoon talk. Um, but before I introduce you to the amazing Vincent Powell, I want to first um, just kind of give a, a little bit of a plug um, to some amazing, amazing uh, people doing some awesome, awesome things. I'm going to do a screen share here if I can. And I screen shared. There we go. So uh, this is the website for PVMU TV. Um, it's a, it's being revamped right now, but it's still open for business. You can see all the things that we're doing. Um, you can click and go to all of our shows, but I don't necessarily want you to focus on that at the moment. I just want to point you towards our website. Um, but what I want you to see, and I'm going to bring this up again later on, is that we have a few resources for our students to make further connections with our hosts, or with our hosts, with our speakers. And in particular, um, I want to take you to our YouTube channel, pvamutv.org. We have a YouTube channel. And because we're no longer in the studio because of COVID-19, that doesn't mean the work has stopped. Um, our news network, our news program, uh, Panther News Network, um, these young people are still moving forward, still producing the work. Um, Zanaria Bowens put a package together today about... Um, jobs have been shut down, many companies have allowed employees to work from home. While both American workers and students are self-quarantining, many are without internet. As of March 23, 2020, it is restricted that Prairie View a and University will be online for the remaining of the semester. Mm -hmm. We're struggling finding alternative solutions to the use Wi-Fi. Xfinity has allowed free Wi-Fi to Americans try a free one-hour pass today to complete your Wi-Fi needs. For more information on how to receive Wi-Fi, visit Xfinity Home page at Xfinity Plus. Now, she shot that thing out of a can, and I'm going to teach Zanaria how to slow down and talk a little bit slower, but she got the information in there. She got and, the she But said, I want you to know about, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, what I want you to know about what these young people are doing, um, even while in quarantine, um, they're still going to bring you the news. They're still going to bring you quality content. Um, they are doing interviews. They're covering uh, various um, election updates. Um, Oh, he is blessed. He said he is blessed. Okay, good. Everybody's blessed. All the all the things that you want to know about what we're doing at Prairie View um, via the news network, you can find out at pbamutv.org. You can also go to our YouTube channel. All the talks from this series will also go on the PVAMU TV uh, YouTube channel starting Monday. We're going to do a little bit of editing you know, put a little opening mm -hmm. sequence on it and put Come our PV commercials in so that y'all know that <laughs> you know, it's HBC British University. Why are we going to stop with HBC? We the best school, the best school. <laughs> We're going to do that. And what we want to show the world is that this thing ain't going to stop us. This thing ain't going to stop us. That's it. We have That's stories it. to tell. We have, we have these. We're going to let yeah. people know. Absolutely. We're going to shoot. And we're going to create and we're going to be out in the world telling our stories. And that's what this man here does. This man, Vincent Powell. Let me tell you about this guy. I met him last summer yeah. when he and the producing team for the freshman year came out to Prairie View and they wanted to scout and, um, you know, was trying to find best places to shoot a college focused film. And uh, J.O. Malone, who y'all met earlier today, if you tuned in this morning at 1130, you met the writer and producer of the film, The Freshman Year, J.O. Malone, founder of the National Black Film Festival. Uh, he introduced me to uh, Vincent on the campus tour so that we can identify the best, best, the best and blessed places <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> to, sure. to shoot the film. And instantly, 
I knew I met a man who walked taller than most and not of ego, oh. but of spirit. Very certain in the stories that he wants to tell, very certain in his voice. And I learned a lot about him that day and even more so during the fall when he came back and directed the film on campus, feature film on campus, Denzel Whitaker, uh, Cheryl Lee Ralph, uh, an amazing cast, an amazing crew, gave uh, what was supposed to be 10 of my students, turned out to be 33 <laughs> of my students, internship opportunities. And yeah, that yeah. is uh, when you work with people of quality spirit who yeah. want to build up other people while doing their work. And that's who Vincent Powell is. Vincent, um, I just, I wanna thank you so much for being here today. Um, I want you, I'm gonna cue something up while you introduce sure. yourself. Sure. So I want you to tell us who you are and what you do in the world, brother. Yeah, so I, I'm grateful to be here with you guys. And it's it's one of those things where COVID-19 has really changed the landscape of how we communicate. But the cost that um, TDV would have put on a budget and sent up to get filled to be able to bring in the dynamic set of speakers that you all uh, will host uh, over the next couple of weeks and have already hosted for the um, the past couple of sessions uh, is out of this world. And when you consider the amount of money being saved now to be able to bring in voices, uh, some voices far more um, no knowledgeable and notable than I, and not have to cover their airfare and their hotel fees and all those things, it's really a blessing. And I think that when you look at some of these workshops that are online pre-coronavirus uh, that were 200 bucks and a thousand bucks to get into and now you're able to pick the minds and the brains of uh, people that you would normally have access to. I think that's so amazing, so amazing. And so I just want to applaud uh, TDV for putting this on and, and just organizing this in such an excellent uh, manner. I'm glad to be here. My name is Vincent Powell. I'm born and raised Houston, Texas. Uh, my wife and I and my one year old he's uh he's in there he's watching toy story right now but if you ever hear a yell or if he wanders in here uh in a diaper with no shirt on that's because i got i got my baby boy also you might be able to hear my wife in background as i said my wife is doing a consultation for a client uh right now a lot of uh churches are you know having to go virtual and so we're coaching pastors through how to relay that uh, virtually because when you're used to talking to a room full of people and now you're just talking to yourself, it gets really awkward really quick. And so she took that on for me today so that I could be with you all. And uh, I graduated from USC uh, last May with my master's in uh, film and television production. I directed my first feature film the freshman year in the fall with uh, the help without which it would have been impossible to do. Uh, with the help of, uh, of Teresa and the, the whole team over there at PV. And then I, uh, I came back to LA uh, sh right after Christmas and hit the ground running with a few things. And then this happened. And so I'm excited to talk to you guys about, uh, you know, my, my vantage point on, on where we are and where we're going. And then uh, I, I want to hear from you guys. I want to leave a, a little more time for Q&A. Uh, I, I enjoyed the idea of collaboration. That's why I'm a filmmaker. I think that filmmaking is the only line of industry that requires the best and the top brightest minds from every uh, part of the spectrum. You need architects, you need engineers, you need scientists, you, you need dancers, you need historians, you need artists, you need photographers, you need yeah. people that can design, you need writers, you need lawyers, you need financial executives. You can go anywhere else on the planet and into any other room and no one else demands the level of collaboration that filmmaking demands. And so, especially when you're talking about commercials and when you're directing commercial and there are lawyers on set making sure the logos are being placed right and there is no copyright infringement happening. I, I directed a, um, a Spectrum commercial um, in January, which was great. I was like, oh my God, this year is starting great. This is about to be lit. I directed four spots for Spectrum, which is like Comcast out here in LA. 
And, um, but they had their people on set. They, they flew people in from New York. They were like, hey, certain shirts have to be changed color in post because that color red looks like Verizon and we can't have that color red in our commercial. And, but as a filmmaker, I'm not thinking like that as, as just a director, but right. it requires so many of the people to speak into it to make this final piece. And so that's, that's why I love filmmaking. I, I love the idea of collaboration. So uh, saying that to say, I'm probably gonna ask that y'all put your cameras on and your mics on a little sooner than we've been doing uh, to jump in. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> and I'm glad to be here. Awesome, man. Awesome. I, you know what, before we, before we go too much further into it, because I do want some time with you just to kind of talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I want, I want the audience to just watch like 30 seconds, 60 seconds of something sure. that has now become a textbook in my class. <laughs> it is required I watching. I was wearing the shirt. Come on. <laughs> Well, it worked for you. You know what works well on yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah, come on. It has become a master class for my students in rule of thirds framing. If you're not familiar with rule of thirds, rule of thirds is a cinematography composition uh, format where you, uh, when you, for instance, when you're shooting on Instagram, I know a lot of you don't like to use the grid, like the nine boxes. You're like, oh, that's like training wheels for photographers. Let me tell you something. You use it if you want your stuff to look good. And this is a prime example of the two, and you could probably see my, my uh, cursor here, the two verticals, there's a lamp on this vertical and there's a lamp on this vertical. And then the two horizontals, I'm willing to bet money I don't have that the bottom horizontal is going through peace and joy. And the top horizontal is probably going right above, right, right, around, right around his brow Teach. bone at his eyes. Teach. Come on now, rule of thirds. <laughs> this is about quality composition. We're also looking at three point lighting. Three point lighting is where you set up a um, three lights. You look, that's all you need really. Three lights, three. Key light, which is the primary light that lights your subject. Fill light, a fill light is a secondary light that is not as bright as the key light and it helps balances the shadows. So you don't have a, you don't, you're not as brightly lit on the other side, but it allows you to maintain your depth. You know, a nose creates shadows, eyelashes create shadows. So you don't want a second light to flood you out. You just want something that can help balance out the shadows a little bit. So right there where my cursor is, I'm fairly certain that's where his, his fill light is a little bit further back. It's not as bright as his key light. And then the third light you need is your backlight. And over here in the corner, giving off some blue illumination over here is his backlight. And what his backlight will do is illuminate his silhouette so that he separates, he pops from the background. He, he becomes a three-dimensional uh, entity. And you can see it on his face. You can see it on his jaw. You can see it on his lovely beard, his shoulders, on down his arm, and on some of the items behind him. The fourth type of light are practicals. Those real life lights that may not contribute to the lighting scheme that of, of your of your of your set, but it gives authenticity to where you are. So he has these lamps and he's got some candles back here. And when I tell you, and then quality sound, when I hit play, you're gonna hear quality <laughs> sound. And when I tell you, a lot of times students will take their cell phones and just you know hold it in front of their face and shoot video like this. If you just turn it landscape. If you just turn it, you get a full frame and you can easily do this. So I use this video now as the template that my students must watch and replicate and replicate. So let me just play a few seconds of it. I'm just gonna play the first minute of it because it's almost 15 minutes long and you will want to watch all 15 minutes. So I'm gonna put this link in uh, the YouTube so you can come back and watch it yourself. set up here for a, a pitch video to a client and I was like I done set these lights up and this mic up I might as well make some content for myself and there's been a lot uh, on my heart in 2019 and I I don't know maybe it'll help somebody this year has been mind blowing by the way I had a son 
January 6th, I graduated with my MFA from the number one film school in the world, University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. I got my master's degree in film television production May uh, 12th. Um, family and friends came down for that. And then we got into the summer. I landed my first feature film gig. Uh, started pre-production on that. My wife got into grad school, starting her master's of educational counseling at the Rossner School at USC, which is amazing. Got two Trojans in the house. Milo has no choice now. Uh, then uh, we get past that. She gets a scholarship. Then I start shooting the film. I wrap the film. And then nothing. Nothing. And it, it's been the most uh, vibrant and desaturated year of my life. The tears I cried this year came from a place I've never cried from before. It was about the uh, mistrust of people. It was about the misuse of time. It was about questioning identity and, and gifts. And then you've got to wonder where you stand in society. And then you say, wait, I got a master's degree. I've, I've done more than some others I know. I've done, I've went a step further than my parents. And now Milo gets to go a step further than me. This is legacy, this is that. Uh, but then you look at the bank account and you have those moments where it hits negative three hundred dollars, and you're like, "Crap! What is this? This my student loans are negative, you know, two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Crap! What what is this? And no, you're not supposed to like get out of grad school and become a millionaire tomorrow and figure it all out." But when you're raising a family and your wife is working full time, your wife is teaching full time, your wife is a part of the Samples Collective, which is the group that supports Kanye Sunday service. And you have a, a kid that's less than a year old. There's a lot that starts to weigh on you. And there's a lot you start to question about yourself. You don't question morals. Yeah, so... You start to question... That. That. Um, first of all, uh, we're going to start our conversation with that video. Sure. Because, number one, as I set it up, it is definitely a master class for the okay. students to see. Certainly, I wouldn't let it go longer than a minute. I went almost four minutes into it because I, I got pulled right back into um, the story again, the, the real life again. And I'm biting back tears again because I remember when you posted it and I called you right away. I texted yeah, you first yeah. and I was like, yeah. brother, yeah. are you OK? Yeah. Yeah. And then I and I, and as we talked, I realized it was a message that um, was so open and transparent and spiritual. Because if and again, people, I know you now going to want to find out what happens next. Because that was just the first three minutes, and he drops so much goodness, so much mm -hmm. hope, so much mm -hmm. wisdom, so much care, so much fear, so much mm -hmm. doubt, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. much humanity so much love and I make my students watch it because I want them to see the simplicity of genuine goodness mm -hmm. and, and what that can look like on camera. Sure. Sure. So there is a little bit of exploiting it a little bit, right? There's a little bit yeah, of- Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. This, well, this and, and, and then, this, and then you know. on, on my end, there's also, inciting incident midpoint resolution you know as as a storyteller mm -hmm. i'm not just turning a camera on and starting and and my wife's a youtuber as well 
And the idea is to re relay authenticity, but there's so much thought that has to go into making it feel authentic. Uh, one of my good friends, a DP, his name is Dan Rubata, he lives in Houston, a mentor of mine that's become a friend. He said, it's amazing how much work we have to put into making something look real. Mm. And we put all this artificial work into it to make it look authentic. Yeah. And you wouldn't walk into my house and see that blue light in the dining room. <laughs> you know, you, you, would, you wouldn't walk in and see a, a 60 watt LED light beaming on my face. Right. Uh, that nothing about it looks natural uh, or, or the setup looks natural, but it comes across naturally. And the score is working and the audio is working. And so even while I'm trying to relay this very relatable story, I'm using all these elements of, of, of storytelling and what I know in my toolkit to say, how do I make something compelling with one person sitting and talking with yeah. limited B-roll? All the B-roll was just JPEGs from Instagram and a couple of shots from YouTube that we got from some BTS of the film. Yeah. Other than that, you know, it's just, it's just me. And so it's like, how do you make that look dynamic? How do you make that work? And so you've got to be able to go to your toolkit and say, oh, I have to tell story. I have to have beats. I have to make this thing work. I have to hit people in a way and I have to let it affect me and before it affects them. And yeah. then I have to edit that thing down and I have to compose that thing. And my wife, we were driving to Houston uh, from LA and I'm editing in the passenger seat with the, the laptop plugged up to the car and I'm editing and I'm, I'm turning her music down and turning my audio up and say, hey, how does this sound? How does this feel? Did you feel yeah. something there? What is it? And, and because you got to be able to know that it can't just pass through your eyes and your hands. You need an audience. You've got to have people to, to bounce ideas off of so that you can get a collective idea that says, oh, okay, maybe now it's ready for release. And once you release it, your job is done. And now it's on people like TDB to tell me yeah. how it affected them, you know? <sighs> I was running through the house. I said, Michelle, he done did a thing. <laughs> so, I, I was looking for her. I was like, yeah and yeah. she's like what are you what are you yelling at mm -hmm. and i i played it for her and we're both in there just weeping openly weeping and so then i posted to facebook and i mm -hmm. i actually tagged a few people um one's uh, a couple i knew exactly who i was aiming when i sent that <laughs> i was pointing you at people wow and the collective was um i did not know a simple vlog, and this is their mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. a simple vlog could make me feel so much. And wow. before we started the call today, one of our students, and she's on right now, I'm going to have her address you later in the Q&A, mm -hmm. but Paven Franklin asked this very question of what can I do now? Like during this, mm -hmm. you know, you start to dry up a little bit. We're all in quarantine. Mm -hmm. We're doing the mm -hmm. same thing day in and day out. We're trying to maintain productivity. We're trying to continue to move forward in our schoolwork and our jobs and our relationships. And, and she said, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to tap out. Like I'm starting, and that's real, right? Absolutely. You, you start Absolutely. to dry up when everything starts to blit, blur together. How are you managing during this pandemic? How do you keep the flow going um, so that you're, you're staying, you're staying sharp. You know, so, um, I want to, uh, oh, oh, you can share. I was about to share my screen. Okay. Um, that, can you take it? Okay. I'll, I'll set it up for you. All right. So I, 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 I think that that's the biggest conversation I've been having with my creative friends and I'm in five, four or five group threads of filmmakers across the nation. I've got uh, one that's heavy on my East Coast people, one that's got my Atlanta people, one that's got my LA people, and then of course my Houston people. And I'm always sharing, you know, insight and information with them. But the um, the idea that everybody's kind of now feeling that thing of, oh my gosh, I feel dry, I feel blank, is so common. And um, I think that this one this one image that I want to share with you really quick uh, describes it best for me because what we've got to do is we've got to give ourselves permission. And this guy tweeted this the other day. He said, if you feel like creating today, fantastic. If you don't feel like creating today, don't beat yourself up. Be healthy, be happy, do you. And I retweeted that, I, I favorited it, and I, I sent it to some people because there's a lot of people that 
feel that way because it's like when you're at home and you've got nothing to do all day but be at home you could feel like watching three movies in a row is unproductive you could feel like laying in the bed until 1 p.m is unproductive what we have to acknowledge is that our psyche our subconscious and the parts of us we don't want to address is experiencing some of the most traumatic social experience that any of us will ever go through. And now, aside from like death of a loved one, uh, the, the abuse within a relationship, you know, uh, divorce, separation, those things, this is so traumatic to not being able to encounter people, especially those of us that are single and don't have a partner or a spouse or uh, roommates, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're not even encountering people it's really hard on your mind because we were made as social creatures and not only were we made socially, but, but we're creative. All of us are creative. And so what I love is seeing people tap into things they didn't know they did. I didn't know that I enjoyed seasoning iron skillets. Last week, uh, my wife cooked, I put the iron skillets in the dishwasher. Yes. That's a no, 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 <laughs> didn't think about it. Right. Didn't think about the fact that that water is going to sit there and then it's going to rust. It's going to rust. And iron yeah. is iron, right? Well, I got on YouTube and figured out how to season the skillet and restore it back. And I wish I would have taken the before and after pictures because now it's like, I, I love it. It's a thing. I like taking <laughs> my, my flax oil and, and rubbing it down with my metal chain yeah. and throwing it in the oven at 500 degrees and just transforming this thing. You uh, better learn the skill set. around the house. You feel yeah. me? <laughs> but, but I think the, the thing, is, and, and, and my wife is dealing with it too. My wife is a full-time teacher. She teaches eighth grade English. So she's with, you know, her 60 students online. Um, luckily right now, she's in the middle of a two week spring break that they just went into, but they're, they're online. My wife, she's in her master's program that's online. So she's in the middle of it. And then we have our 14 month old with us. And it's like, yo, this feels crazy because when you have time to edit your own stuff and work on your own stuff. And for me, when I'm getting calls from friends and clients and potential clients, as I'm processing my workload, I'm having to leave room just for nothingness and be okay with saying, you know what? I'm going to play my Xbox today for a couple of hours. I'm going to watch right now, we're binging the Marvel series chronologically and not in order of release date. Yeah. And so, you know, we're, we're doing that, watching two or three Marvel films a day and just giving ourselves permission to binge Tiger King and Ozark and, you know, and not say, oh my God, we're being lazy. It's like, yo, as long as that baby is fed and clean and as long as, you know, our lights are on and we're, we're fed, we're safe, that's yeah. enough. You don't have to demand the creativity every day. You just yeah. got to demand that you're present when mm. you feel like it. And when the creativity comes, let it overwhelm you. But, but when it's not there, don't be overwhelmed. It'll yeah. come back. Yeah, you know, there's nothing, nothing normal about what we're experiencing right now. Absolutely. And so the idea that we have even the capacity to operate um, business as usual is, is just asinine to even contemplate. Sure. Um, I, I pray for my students every, every night. And I, I'm not yeah. a religious person. I'm definitely a mm -hmm. spiritual person. Sure. sure. And I just go to a place of, please, Lord, keep my family safe, Absolutely. my wife and my parents yeah. and, you know, all that. But my students are also my extended family, right? And Absolutely. I push them. I, you know, I get after them like somebody's mama, but mm -hmm. I can hear the wear on them. I can hear... Um, we were talking about the power of TikTok right now. And I said, you know what, you know why TikTok is finding its legs right now is because people miss hugging. They miss high-fiving. They miss giving each other dap. And so what we'll do is we'll watch a ridiculous video. We'll Straight watch relation. a silly yeah, yeah. dance challenge. We will yeah. embrace animals, little pets doing crazy, you know, things on trampolines. We will watch these things because they have transformed. They, they take us someplace for just a little while. And we have that, that joy rise up mm -hmm. for just a little while. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it goes back to what you say that maybe, you know, uh, productivity comes best in waves in times like this Yeah, and Absolutely. take what you need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before we get to your lecture, mm -hmm. I have a question about 
your experience at TSU, your mm-hmm. experience at USC, and how sure. did you navigate the journey from one amazing HBCU to one mm-hmm. amazing PWI? And 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 yeah. and through that transition, how did they both serve you? Yeah. So uh, before before you lies um, two pieces of paper that uh, cost me a total of two hundred and fifty five thousand um, dollars. And the decision uh, to to go from TSU and only owing twenty eight thousand dollars going to USC and then adding the rest of that uh, massive load uh was one that I didn't think I'd make. So I want to talk to the people that bloom, not late, but slow. I graduated uh, from Eisenhower High School, Alden ISD, and in 2006, I went up to UNT in Denton, started my RTF program there. You were a pre-RTF student, and then you could get in after a year. I was bored. So I joined the school news. I was bored because I was only doing the weather on Wednesday nights. And so I wanted other things to fill my time. So I joined the NAACP and the gospel choir. And I started my own Bible study. And I was a treasurer of the dorms. And I was on the coalition of Black student organizations. And then I started my own Black theater company with some friends because the other company was obviously white in theater company and I'm up here playing a Russian prince and I'm like y'all this doesn't make sense and so we start our own thing and so that's consuming my time and then I was designing flyers I figured out how to be creative and bring some money in that way and I'm editing probate videos and you know and I had a girlfriend and I'm, I'm Mr. Personality and my grades plummeted to 1.6 and they said, bye. And my dad said, we're not about to pay for you to stay up there. So you're coming home. And I was like, cool. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to U of H because I'm tired of being at PWIs. And they're, they're, they're not speaking to me. I'm going to go to TSU. I go to TSU. And I go to TSU because I wanted to meet Dr. Freeman, T.F. Freeman, the uh, director of the debate team. Um, who also happened to train the cast and crew of The Great Debaters. Um, Which the only reason on my wall is because it's one of my favorite films, John Q and The Great Debaters. My wife bought me those a couple of Christmas ago. But go to TSU, I dive in, graves through the roof. And it was one of those things where it's like, oh, I don't want to feel like the black school demands less. I want to make sure that I'm just applying myself more. And what I, what I found out was the black school, the, they cared more about who I was and what I was outside of the classroom than just what I am as a member on a, on a sheet. So because I was on the debate team and I was traveling to Berlin, Germany and Budapest, Hungary and uh, Tanzania, South Africa or, or Africa and and to uh, Dubai and traveling the country, debating and competing and winning. Um, the, the ability for them to email me my work and share notes and lectures with me um, as if I was an athlete was so comforting because at, at, at other schools, you have to be an athlete to get that kind of permission. You know what I mean? You have to be Reggie Bush at USC. You have to be right. Vince Young at yeah. UT to get that kind of that, that kind of diligent. But but at TSU, they're like, you're representing us, we'll make accommodations. Sure. And so it was easy to, to love it. It was easy to feel supported. Um, but the downside was the film program there was almost non-existent. They had studios, they had cameras that they may have shot Dr. King with. Um, they had uh, spaces, they had teachers that may have also walked arm in arm with Dr. King. They had, um, and I'm not saying that walking with Dr. King and shooting him is bad. I'm saying that in 2009, when I get there, if y'all ain't updated this stuff now, what are you teaching me? Why are you teaching me how to slide a radio? Like, why, why am I learning radio when podcasts are about to be the next wave? Why are you teaching me FM radio 
when right now, if you want to make money, you got to have a podcast. And there are people hiring right now, especially remotely, the jobs for podcast producers and engineers are through the roof. I wish I would know how to work Pro Tools and Logic and Audition to be able to mix and master. And I can do some audio stuff. But 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 to have spent the time I spent learning radio yeah. on an FM transmitter was so frustrating to me. And I, I met Tyrone Dixon. Uh, he was a professor at TSU who also graduated from TSU and went to AFI here in LA. And he, he was like, Vincent, if you want more, you're going to have to go to LA. And he was like, I had to do the same thing. I graduated from Yates. I, I came to TSU. I graduated from there, but I wanted to be a director. And he said, I had to go to LA. And that's what made me start looking at USC. And I applied three times. I got denied twice, two years in a row. And then I applied one last time, submitted my application on the deadline day at midnight. Luckily, midnight in Houston is actually just, you know, 10 a.m., 10 p.m. here. So I worked till 2 a.m. uploading my video and got in on the video that I took the least amount of time to think through. I was over producing my application and they wanted to see where my barrier for growth was. And so the one application when I didn't think so hard and when I was off the cuff and Kaylin's in here, I called Kaylin one morning, I called another friend of mine. I said, hey, I need y'all to meet me at Herman Park. We're about to shoot something. And on the day we shot, the next day I edited and submitted. And I got in. And I came to you to uh, LA. My, my wife and I moved. We, we were married for just a year when I got accepted, and she was down for the move. We moved. She knew that her job would be to be the breadwinner. She'd keep teaching. Uh, I'm gonna go into school full time. I go to school full time, and I realized very quickly that my black voice there is only. Uh, they only recognize what they'd already seen before. So to them, I'm the next Ryan Coogler or the next Tyler Perry or the next Jordan Peele or John Singleton. And I'm like, don't give me those kind of superlatives. I am right. myself. While all those people's work have inspired me and pushed me to this place. And John Singleton and Ryan Coogler being graduates of USC were the defining reason why I came. Um, they, they're, I'm not creating their work. Mm. And I dealt with a bunch of conversations with, with white professors who did not know how to talk or deal with black work. I'll give you two quick stories. One story was in a writing class. Uh, we, our assignment was just a five page short. And one girl, uh, a friend of mine who's from Atlanta, she wrote a story about a woman who does back alley abortions. And one day the cops bust the scene the woman runs and leaves a woman on the table and that woman bleeds out and dies. The professor says to my black friend, this would never happen. No one would die from an abortion. You need to write a stronger story. And I was like, excuse me. And she's like, she, she, she made room for me to speak. Uh, and I said, I disagree. And she's like, okay, Vincent, you know, your conversation's done. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't think it's okay for you to tell someone that their story is unrealistic just because you grew up in Hollywood Hills mm -hmm. and you don't know that people die from back out of abortions. And I pulled my phone out and it's a no phone policy. I said, but I, I got to pull up some stats for you because I'd like you to know that people don't just die from back out of abortions. They also die from over the counter, over the table abort abortions that are legal and approved. And it happened under Obama and Bush and Clinton and Bush. Like this is not a new uh, idea. And the idea that, that women in the hood can't afford or don't want to be seen in public spaces to get abortions and have to go get back alley abortions where they can pay that person in other things other than money is a very real thing. But to me, it didn't bother me, Vincent. It bothered me that my friend who's younger than me and not as strong in her voice that could have affected the way she told stories for the rest of her life. And wow. then that same professor told yeah. another student that, you know, one of her stories was two Chinese. And I'm like, yo, she's from China. You can't, <laughs> but, but, but they thought they could say those kinds of things. And so she ended up giving me a B at my midterm. And I said, excuse me, why do I have a B? And she said, well, your work isn't Oscar award worthy. And I said, that'd be cool if the goal of this class for you was for you to teach me how to get an Oscar. 
Ooh. But your job is to teach me how to help a character enter, how to make yeah. sure I transition to my next act, how I make my inciting incident clear. It doesn't matter if you do know or don't know my character. It doesn't matter if you believe that person does or doesn't exist because sci-fi is a thing too. So guess what? I can make up a story about a toenail going to space if I want to. Come but on. Your, that's not your job. Write it. And so I ended up writing her up <laughs> and sending it to the dean. She no longer oh. in that class anymore. She's there. She had to take a semester off. She hates me. Like, literally, we saw each other at graduation, and she abhors my, the sight of me. But I felt like if I didn't use my voice in moments like those, that there are so many of my peers who would feel silenced in what they know. Yeah. And you can only write what you know. Yeah. You can only write what you know. You can't, you can't come out writing something else. Sure. Uh, you know, you've got to have experienced it or be knowledgeable in it enough to be able to, to tell that kind of story. So yeah. briefly, that, that was the big difference in the two different spaces. And, and I walked through USC as a black man, letting everyone know I was a black man every single day. And I told stories that I felt resonated with. Man, okay, so students, um, we're about to get into Vincent's actual lecture, but I hope you heard him say the, the following things. Um, he could not have pulled up those figures if they hadn't done some element of research. So every piece of filmmaking, even narrative films, you don't have to, you know, with documentaries, the research is a part of it because it's a documentary. Sure, it's sure. It's not fiction, it's supposed to tell the truth. And you think, you know, well, with narrative films, you're making up the world, you're creating the universe, mm -hmm. but that's not entirely true. There still has to be mm -hmm. some authenticity to the story that you're telling. Mm -hmm. So for instance, with the abortion statistics and the um, mortality, uh, the, the maternity mortality rates, whether in choice of getting a, an abortion or through actual childbirth, knowing mm -hmm. those stats, knowing that history, knowing that uh, research is key to telling an amazingly authentic story. And then write what you know. That lesson can't, no matter how many times you feel like you say it to people, um, you can you can write a dynamic sci-fi story of someone Absolutely. going off to the middle of nowhere space and still write what you know about solitude, Absolutely. isolation, Absolutely. discovery, journey, yeah. fear, exploration. Mm -hmm. So he's already giving you some stuff to walk away with. I'm gonna mute my mic. Give us about 10 minutes sure, of, of, a, sure. of a great lesson, and then we'll open it up sure. to the students. Um, I'm going to talk for a second, but if students, if you guys could, in the chat, tell me if you'd rather me talk about fundraising or story. And um, and I'll, I'll look at that and I'll decide. Uh, I'd called to rest a little while ago. I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I want to talk about. But so here's the thing. What she just said about writing what you know, that was something I learned in my HBCU because being on the, uh, who said both duh, that's so funny. <laughs> um, being on the debate team, we were required to be updated at every moment on what was happening in the news. Because debate, uh, what happens is you get a topic in the competition, you get a topic, and then you have seven minutes to develop your argument. And for that topic, you may be assigned to be for it or against it. So no matter what your beliefs are, your morals are, who you voted for, you, you have to argue whatever you're assigned. And so, you know, in a moment like today, the, the topic may be, hey, this house believes that President Trump is handling the COVID-19 uh, uh, response very well. And you may be for that. And you have to argue that he is handling it well. And while you may believe in your heart that he's not handling it well, you have to have enough skill and acumen to be able to convince the judge and the jury that you believe that. That only comes from knowing stats and also knowing what they are saying on Fox News about it. To be able to take the Fox News angle, it's also knowing what they're saying on uh, CNN. Is that somebody at the door? Uh, what they're saying on CNN about it as well. And you've got to be able to argue that. And so in that same sense, I approach every story the same way as a preacher. I've been preaching since I was 15. As a preacher, I approach sermons. Like I have to make a statement, a thesis, and then I have to use every single moment following to uphold that thesis. And that only comes from being knowledgeable and being aware. So podcasts, YouTube channels, you know, I, I watch things that I'm not even, I, I, there's this auto detailing YouTube channel that I'm addicted to. It is oddly satisfying, 
I can watch it. Come on. I can watch it all day. I don't ever buy the products or detail my own car, but I can watch these people restore these cars all the time. Now, Wait, that time never- out. <laughs> I have to celebrate because I, I spent hours watching these people deconstruct minivans come that, on, you know, the on. parents of three babies. Cool yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, go ahead. But, but, but those, those things, you don't know when that will pop up. You don't know. I don't know right now. I do have a friend who's writing the auto mechanic show about um, some women in Detroit who work for car factory. They're being laid off. And now one of them wants to open their own car shop. And so it's kind of Fast and Furious meets Charlie Angel, meets Charlie's Angels, uh, meets, you know, one of those random shows on Discovery Channel that just restores cars. And so the... Uh, the that is why I was fascinated with the pot because the pot was a YouTube thing. I, I saw that coming, but all all those things matter, you know, and it it matters to you know have your favorite series and your shows. You don't know when those characters will speak to you, and you don't even when you're writing, you don't know who's talking. But it's those experiences um, that that come through you and help you to speak through them. Uh, I'll start on story. And then we'll move to fundraising. I saw enough of the comments that said both. And very quickly, and then Teresa, just wave at me when I'm done. Um, on story, uh, I think it's important for us to to talk about to talk about this, especially in this environment. Um, Teresa, can you give me the power to share again on the thing? Uh, so I think it's important right now because right now you have a lot of time, and developing story takes no resources but time that's all it takes is just time and you have a lot of time on your hands and so right now if you're not talking through stories pitching stories figuring out you know how to how to work through the story you're not really serving yourself and so i want to share another tweet with you um uh that i think speaks exactly to uh this group of people um uh sloan posted this uh yesterday i believe she said writers of color if you ever needed someone to tell you when to go hard and really put yourself out there, here it is. The time is now. Every meeting I've had today has made that clear. So put in the work and check out at Diverse Rep if you need representation and or resources. And Diverse Rep is a, is a great resource where they particularly work on representing people of diverse backgrounds. Um, I, I'm, I'm not so much here to plug Diverse Rep as I am here to plug the idea that I've been having meetings during the Rona and people are liking the stories and now that means to write. And so you've got you've to know how and when to, to make the time to, to do these things. And right now, you don't have to make the time. The time is there before you. I want to share one more uh, tweet with you. This tweet from uh, one of my favorite people to follow on, online. Um, this, I believe he's a writer, but he, he always puts out these challenges. He said, there are 180 busy days left in 2020. If you write one page a day, you can write nearly two scripts or squeeze in that novel before the year's end. That's just two pages a day. That's 500 words a day, about a dozen tweets. That means three scripts or one nice thick novel by New Year's. Somebody should screenshot that. That's a challenge. And what I love about that also is his calculation gives you your weekends off. That's not, it's 180 business days uh, until the new year. But th- the idea that if you want to work through the weekend, whatever excuse you feel like you have, it's gone uh, as far as writing is concerned. There are people that you normally could not get meetings with that would be happy to sit down with you via Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, uh, right now I'm working on a biopic where I've got to talk to some people that know some things. And I had a list of people I was going to contact. And now I'm able to contact those people and make time. And some of these people are able to talk the same day. Uh, there was a, there's a story that I pitched to a friend of mine that works at a studio out here. She's an exec. It's a story I stopped writing two years ago because a professor at USC said I probably won't get the rights. But this woman of color who said, and the professor was a good guy, friend of mine, I believe he's an advocate, but he, he didn't see the importance in the story that I saw. And so he brushed it off with, I heard someone else try to get the rights to that story. You probably can't get the rights, so move on. 
I moved on. I listened to the lie. He didn't lie to me, but I listened to the lie and I moved on. I opened my Dropbox up two years later. It's a story I, I keep talking to my wife about, but I opened it up and I saw I hadn't touched it in two years. My friend and I were talking about diverse stories. She was throwing out some ideas. I was sharing some ideas that I'm pitching right now for a TV show, uh, two TV shows, a, a movie, one that I pitched to Disney. They didn't like it only because I didn't know that bull riding was a form of animal cruelty because you tied the wire around the testicles to make them buck. I didn't know that. I just thought they bucked because they were mad. The rope pulls the balls and that's why they buck. So Disney was like, oh, we love the story, but uh, no. So now I'm reshopping that. Uh, but there are so many people around town that are popping up with their own production companies. Um, you've got Steph Curry, you've got President Obama, you've got uh, uh, Angela Merkel, uh, not Angela Merkel, uh, What's our princess name with uh, the boy? Megan. Uh, Megan. Megan. Megan Markle. Yeah, I'm, I'm up here talking about Angela Merkel. Isn't she the PM of... Uh, anyway, Megan Markle and her company, Marci Martin, Yar Shahidi. Just, you know, all these people have these platforms that are looking for stories that aren't the normal. And so I'm talking through these stories and they're interested. And so that's why I want to share that story, share that tweet, because right now that story that you feel like is a little weird and a little crazy is, is really important. So real quick about story. You've got to know that you have a character that is relatable. And here's, here's another test that I give people, how you know you're writing a TV show and how you know you're writing a film. If you, if you have an idea about a person that you really like and that you could watch over and over in different situations, you're talking about a TV show. If you have a place or a time that comes and goes, you're now talking about a film or a limited series. If there's an event, if we're talking about the Super Bowl of 1998, we're talking about a movie because that ends, or a limited series, that ends, it doesn't keep going. That's definitely a movie, um, no matter how you write it. It could be a comedy, it could be a thriller, whatever, but it's a movie because 1998 comes and goes. If we're talking about Vincent and TD go to the 1998 Super Bowl, now we're talking about two characters that you also want to see go to the night to the 2001 Wimbledon game. And you want to see them go because maybe she's not, you know, uh, athletically inclined. And maybe I'm just there to, to, to find girls and we just go. And but, but we have these things about ourselves that you just want to see us in different environments. Now we're talking about a show. We're talking about Insecure in Atlanta. And we're talking about these different environments. We're talking about sitcoms. We're talking about procedurals. We're talking about just the idea that we, we come and go. We watch Grey's Anatomy because we like the characters. If they move from the hospital down to Cedar sinai in LA, we'd still watch it. It would still be called Grey's Anatomy because it was never about the place. It was never about the, the, the time. It was about these characters. That's why Harry Potter could have kept going, but it stopped. But it was in movie form because getting Harry Potter in bite size wouldn't have worked. Also because it's based on a novel and that's a different IP conversation. But but if you're ever wondering, am I talking about a web series or a TV show or am I talking about a movie or am I talking about a limited series? Do that test of am I talking about character or place in the time? Am I talking about a person's response or am I talking about, but like with my biopic, that person's time came and went. So it's not a TV show unless it's a limited series. But there's no way I would make what I'm writing and researching now into a show that's gonna have six seasons and a hundred episodes because it came and went, it's a person. And then um, we can jump into some of that with your Q and A's. I wanna jump to fundraising really quick. My biggest note on fundraising is after you develop a story and you found an audience that agrees with it and you tested that story out. And it's not just a story that you like because mama said it was funny. It's a story that you took to somebody else who's made decisions and they also said the same. Um, when you start your fundraising, I'll tell you how I raised $15,000 in two weeks on a goal of $2,000 to shoot a 12 minute film. First thing I did, and I'm giving this to y'all for free because I'm definitely about to drop a course online in the next uh, month or so because I got time. Uh, the, the idea is I text about 20 of my friends and I said, hey, for my birthday, I don't want anything from anybody. I'm not having a party. I don't want to have a dinner. Whatever money you would spend on me, keep it. If you could just share this image to your platform. And it was a, a image that I made in Photoshop that announced the launch of my fundraising campaign. 
And I shot a dope video, as you could imagine. I shot a video, three minute video, told them why I wanted to shoot it. Those 20 people shared it. In 24 hours, I had $2,000. Now, let me tell you why. The reason, so that's the, for the first thing, is get a, people, a group of people around you that will help support it. Then the secret is if you don't reach 10% of your goal in the first 24 hours, your fundraising fails. If you don't reach 30% of your goal in the first week, your fundraising fails. I don't want to give you generally, I don't want to say 90% of the time. I want you to understand it's black and white. You need 10% in the first 24 hours. So if I wanted $2,000, my wife and I pulled out $200 and we made the first donation. So by the time people clicked it, I was already 10% of the way there making a personal sacrifice. Now, people move, jump on moving trains. So when they jump on it and saw 10% and my 20 friends shared it and their friends saw it, the people that gave me the most money, I had four people give me $1,500 each. I didn't know either one of them. They were all friends of friends. But the video I made was compelling enough. And that $1,500 number that I casually threw out in my video became an anchor and that caused people to say, how close can I get to 1500? I had three people give a thousand. And now I've met my, I met half of my goal off of seven people giving off of people I didn't know, but I did it in a way that was strategic, knowing that I needed 10% in the first 24 hours, 30% in the first week. And that's what got me to my goal. Those three, knowing those three things will make or break your idea of how you raise money and how you can fund an idea. And sometimes you just need to fund shooting the teaser trailer. You don't need to shoot the whole series. You just need a teaser trailer and a good script to be able to go pitch to people and let them bring the money in to fund it. Sometimes you want to fund the short version of it as a proof of concept. It's, the sh it's five pages of your 90 page script. You've got to know those things before you start that and you've got to assemble people that can help you raise that not not the money but raise the idea from the ground I, I i was meeting with teams of people to help me pull this thing together for two months before i ever hit go on the fundraiser mm. so those are my two thoughts and i'm down to open the floor wherever td wants to take this hey look okay so first of all y'all y'all remember justin simeon said the exact same thing on tuesday when he talked about how he got dear white people made the film how he got h town baby he shot yeah. Uh, uh, the trailer and I went back mm -hmm. and watched it on the original trailer and mm -hmm. you could tell it was a labor of love. It was a labor mm -hmm. of passion. It didn't have the same mm -hmm. resources behind it that he eventually mm -hmm. got, but that's what he did. He shot a trailer and, and used that as leverage for, you know, piquing people's curiosity and interest and um, Kickstarter. I've, 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 operated three Kickstarter campaigns. And the one that was the most successful, that was the key. You had to understand that you had to jump out the gate showing people that you have support and the rest followed. Um, it's not easy. It's not like you just sit back and let it happen. It's just, it's exactly the way Vincent says, you have to really work your network. You have to work your, your support and get them, get them on with you. Okay, so we have time for two maybe three questions our next speaker uh starts at four o'clock and he's texted me he's, he's excited he's ready to go so i want to make sure at the very least um we're able to start at four straight up with patrick all right so open your mics open your cameras and and talk to vincent all right talk to me guys all right, I guess go first. hello what up what up brother yeah, hey. love. I see your baby doing good. Man, <laughs> he can open doors by himself now. Oh man, big boy. Talk yeah, me, man. USC School of Cinematic Arts with the debt mm -hmm. and everything. Was it worth it? And with the you talking about your third video uh that got you in or whatever, and you did something mm -hmm. different. Hi. What exactly was it? You you kind of briefly Hi. what exactly was you did in the third video? Hi. That, Set you apart. I just want to say hi back to her. Right, right, right. Back so, to him. Um, Sorry. So my uh, no, you're fine. So the the biggest difference, you, do you, I'm, I'll, I'll answer both ways. So the biggest difference I did with the video was I didn't try to take like a script and get because the rule is you can't um, use dialogue. 
And so I was taking scripts that I already had and taking the dialogue out and trying to see how to shoot it visually. I took a concept and said, a guy loses his job and wants to kill himself. And I just shot that through the day. And so we shot the Metro station, him going to work, him coming out of his house, him. And, and under that, I just put a nice score. And I stopped the idea of, oh my God, let me you know, show them what I have because I found out that they were looking for weak spots because they want to couple you with people that have strengths. But if you come in super strong, then you don't need anything. And so uh, that was that was the difference was I stopped thinking so hard about trying to blow them away. And I just told something that was just a, a, a sentence that could be told over and over and every scene could point to one idea. And, and, and then your question about was it worth it? I tell people all the time, like, hey, if, if you can't afford it, go for it. If you feel like you have the people skills, I, I, well, this is what I tell people. I paid $200,000 to join in a, an exclusive country club. <laughs> and I know that. I, I didn't go for what I learned because YouTube is available. So I can, I can figure stuff out with Google. I, I went for who I need because those people that I was in classes with, those are gonna be the CEOs and the presidents of these studios that I'm gonna to wanna to tell stories with. And it's a whole lot easier to send an email at USC or with a USC signature in LA and get stuff done than it is, you know, without. Now, if I would've went to NYU or AFI, one of those schools that would've taught more run and gun, independent filmmaking, you can do it by yourself. Here's how we raise the money you know, it would have been a different taste, but I, I knew I wanted to figure out the studio structure. I want, I like doing the indie stuff, but I want to get into that studio space. I like franchises. I like knowing how much I'm going to be paid and when I'm going to be paid. And, um, and I like being able to, to, to have the money to market it. So that, that was what made me go was I wanted the network. I, I felt like I didn't have that in Texas and that's the only reason why I went, but I wouldn't speak $200,000 worth of debt on anybody, not even my own job. <laughs> Man, if you get a chance, if any of you have an opportunity to make your way to LA, even for a visit, get Absolutely. onto the campus at USC and walk through the cinematic school. First of all, sure. it's modeled after the Paramount lot. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like to me. It, it felt very much the arch, um, the, 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 the colors, the textures, the feel um, looked a lot like Paramount and, and that's by design it's yeah. a it's yeah. it's a functioning um back lot uh sound mm -hmm. stages Absolutely. were amazing uh the Absolutely. editing suites all all the spaces were very much drawn akin to um functioning uh industry uh levels so even yeah. if you just go for a walkthrough just go and visit um i went to grad school in los angeles too and it yeah, yeah. got to go for a little while um mm -hmm. who else has a question anybody it's probably not a bad idea for me to go ahead and put a pin in it and share with you that you can engage with the students um via the shoot your shot page that we have set up sure. where each student can uh give you a that you know they have the opportunity to to share a link with each of our guests uh so that you can see who they are and what they do uh, you click that link, it takes them, takes you to um, a site of their choice. Uh, some of them are using LinkedIn. Uh, some of them have a, um, a, a visual portfolio. Others are using, you know, a, a, you know, a gateway right to <clears throat> their YouTube channel so that you can Love see it. their work. Um, I will say two people, because um, there's another set of classes that started at 3.30, sure. and so some people had to leave. Yeah. Um, Gerald May, who's an extraordinary writer, he said, I have to go. Thank you yeah, for speaking with us it. today. Um, yeah. And Paven, you can see the notes over there. I just wanted to share that so that they, you know, yeah. they kind of did the church thing and tipped on out. Um, I my my boy, final Gerald question Malone. to you Gerald, before you, <laughs> before we, we depart is how close are you how close are you to uh, having your class ready and how much are you going to charge to, to, um, I, I don't know. J.O., turn your camera know. on before, before you go, go ahead. Vince. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know right off the top of my head. Um, I, it, it's something that I've been wanting to do and I have friends that are in that. I'm, I'm that person to a lot of people. I don't have a Vincent for Vincent. 
And I have a, some friends that are like, Vincent, here's your dead time. Pull your yeah. camera out, get your scripts together and get it recorded and we can build a website. And I'm like, you're right. And, you know, I think about what all I, I can talk on uh, at length and what kind of workbooks I can put out. And so I'm, I'm, I'm examining right now. I'm looking at real estate people on YouTube and how their portals are set up and how much mm -hmm. are they charging and, you know, how much y'all want to charge for one-on-one -on -one sessions or small yeah. group things like this to be live. I don't know. I don't know. But I am, uh, I know one thing. I'll definitely uh, get in touch with you and make sure that the kids uh, don't have to, don't have to uh, break off. Uh, to get in there, so. <laughs> well, I, I, reason I say that I, I, I would like to sponsor if you know, we can talk about the rates and stuff, but sure. I'm going to commit to sponsoring two students once your class is up. Oh, you, I will sponsor so students awesome. to take your class. Yeah, but you ain't gonna break me, bro. I'm letting you know. No, right I, listen, I would, I would never, I would never, I would never. <laughs> Dale Malone, turn your mic on. No, bro. I'm. I'm, I'm going to sponsor two students because yeah, I, I look, I, I take I the master that. classes, the son, you know, sure. I took Spike Lee's master class. I, I, I and it's sure. worth it. It's so worth it. Yeah. And I teach a class, yeah. I teach a business plan class and it's evergreen on the other side of that man. Exactly. It's evergreen. Exactly. It. That's, That's it. You know, and That's the time it. and these times right now, evergreen is not a bad thing. No, I no. Wanted, I wanted uh, J.O. to turn his mic and his camera on real quick before we depart. My brother. You know, the yeah. dynamic duo. A VP. Hey, what up, brother? You good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, we, we ain't talked in a week. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Man. They're knee deep uh, in post-production on the freshman year, so. <sighs> it's right we, there on the screen. We, 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 we're climbing through it. It's this funny thing where Denzel is now, he, he's been a poster in my house for two years, and now he's on my screen, and my neighbor, literally, I could throw a rock and, and hit his house. Wow. Uh, uh, but yeah, it, it's funny how, how life happens. But yeah, J.O., um, the the president and founder of the National Black Film Festival and producer of the freshman year, uh, called me and passed the script to me and we were able to collaborate and, and uh, learn so much and, uh, you know, keep, keep this idea of bringing production to Houston going. And, and I hope to be able to employ so many of you that are on the chat today. Um, you know, sometime when we can be you gotta around let, each other. You got to let them know when you... You gotta let you know when you need to give your baby away. And so when when Vincent came into the fold, it's like he's yeah. like, is it okay for me yeah. to change up some stuff? Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, hey man, yeah. do your thing, make it better, you know. And he he took it from a, a story to uh, to a feature film, and and I couldn't have done it without him. And so he put his director's touch on the film in in every sense of the word. Thank you, bro. You, you two were a dynamic duo. I mean, one day one of you were Batman and the other was Robin, and then the next day the <laughs> yeah, other was yeah, Batman yeah. and the other was Robin. Come on. And Come on. I just enjoy playing Wonder Woman and all of it. I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop. Yeah. Look, y'all, it was by design I asked you two to come on today. Um, sure. on the same day back to back because I wanted to wrap up and finish by saying thank you both for um bringing that project to the university. It gave our students a real practical, real time. They felt the urgency behind getting the work done. You know, when we're saying we're losing the light, it means one thing coming from the teacher, but when there's yeah. money on the table and, you know, professionals yeah. from Houston and Los Angeles saying, man, mm -hmm. we losing the light, all of a sudden you gotta move. they got Come it, they clicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna continue to do more of that. And um, look, you know, we're not Los Angeles, um, but we are Houston. We are Prairie That's View, it. and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna grow filmmakers out in the fields if we have to. So That's it. Uh, I That's appreciate it. both. Y'all keep keep creating. I wanted to uh, as we close, I want to show one more photo uh, because some people think that um, it's all about magic uh, when you're doing this kind of stuff. And I just always want to remind people that it's always about angles. And um, I'm trying to airdrop this real quick to my iPad. There we go. Oh, I have a quick um, question. Go for it. I, I can answer a quick one. Okay, what books or movies or even music inspires you to want to create? Um, books. I've got uh, right now. Uh oh, don't fall. Um, and you see it's in reach. I'm really reading these. Uh, this is the tools of screenwriting. Um, a writer's guide to the craft and elements of a screenplay by David Howard and Edward Mabley. 
Uh, this is a good one I, I use when I'm in the thick of writing. Um, of course, you've heard of Save the Cat. Uh, Save the Cat, that's one I definitely recommend to help me with um, getting through my second act, especially because I'm, like I said, I'm dealing with a, a biopic now. And then I'm reading The Shock Doctrine right now. Shock Doctrine is about the rise of this disaster capitalism. And I feel like there's a, a the coronavirus stories after this are going to be really high. And so you've got to figure out what your angle is going to be. But there are people that are going to want to buy it. You realize that there are movies like White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen that comes out in the same year and they're about the same thing, but they're two different studios. That's going to happen a ton over the next five years or so. And so it's like, let's figure out what our angle is. So those are what I'm, what I'm reading now. Um, and then nofilmschool.com. And then there's a bunch of YouTubers that, you know, make this thing feel all right. But, Tell you uh, what, yeah. do me a favor because yeah. I do have to end this call. Like, like yeah, you go for it. You know, we're we're starting to back up with the the next go one. But shoot me an email, Vince, um, with sure. the titles, and I'll Absolutely. share that with the students. I'll put it in everyone's e courses. Awesome. The the resources that he gives us for sure. Much love, y'all. Thank you, brother. Thank me. you Anytime. again. Thank you Anytime. so much. Thank y'all for attending. We had we had a large crowd in here today. You can't tell it on the YouTube channel because you can only see based on people who are actually turning on their videos. So it may look like there were only one or two people in the session, but um, you know we had a we had a stacked house in here at one point, and it gotten up to about yeah. thirty five people um, watching you. And um, I just appreciate you. I love you. For sure. I All right, you, thanks, y'all. We'll see you uh, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Patrick Walker, come right sure. back. Much love, everybody. Y'all be.